Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing very well. Today we're in the F-15C Eagle and we're looking at using the air-to-air -air radar for BVRU. So, the usage could be split into two, ACM and BVR. ACM are modes designed for interactions within 10 miles of the hostile and BVR is 10 miles or further out. Now, in reality, those two modes overlap slightly, but the theory is solid. So today it's BVR only above 10 miles. We're going to look at the various radar functions for BVR use, but we are not today looking at weaponry or weapons employment. That will be in separate videos. So, first of all, we're going to look at today's controls to put our aircraft into BVR beyond visual range mode. That there. Next, to cycle our radar on and off we've got that there and i use the i key on the keyboard next to switch between the two main sub modes that's range while search and track while scan we've got that key there i use o key on the keyboard next to i while using your radar for bvr you'll be constantly switching between rws and tws depending on what you're doing to increase the range scale or to zoom in if you like we've got that key there to zoom out we've got that there to elevate the radar upwards, to point it upwards, we've got that there. To point it downwards, we've got that there. To slew it left, we've got that there. To slew it right, we've got that there. To manipulate the TDC, target designating cursor, up, down, left, and right, we've got him, 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 him there. You can also center it with that, but I personally don't use that. To gain a target lock, you've got that there. To unlock one of your TWS track targets, you've got that there. And to change the PRF, the pulse repeat frequency, we've got that there. So that should be all the buttons that I'm going to be using today. I suggest binding that to your HOTAS or your joystick if you can. If not, then do what I've done and use the keyboard where you need to. This is the mission we've got. That's our F-15C. Here is a bunch of hostiles. We've got bears, friendly and hostile, plus a flight of SU-34s. They are programmed to simply go left and right and left and right and they're not going to engage or evade any fire. So I can just practice my BVR radar. I will press the active pause button in my F-15 so I will not move. I will stay still but these guys will carry on moving. I will link a copy of this mission in the video description so you can download it if you want and practice your F-15 radar. In the cockpit now, this here is our radar B-scope that we're going to be using and of course we've got our HUD up here. The radar B-scope is designed so that we can go head down like this while searching and still fly the aircraft. The first thing we're going to do is go into BVR mode as we saw earlier. Next we're going to engage our radar. We're going to press the I key to power it up. That is our basic display. This is called our B scope. The area, the diversion beam of scan zone that our radar is scanning is stretched into this quadranted square here called B scope. This guy zipping along left and right here is the actual position of the azimuth of our antenna so it turns left and right and the actual location where it is at any point in time is where it's actually scanning otherwise known as a b sweep this carrot here is the current elevation of our antenna and you can see it's moving up and down in what we call bars now it's important to remember on the f-15 this is a very much simplified game style radar as opposed to the high fidelity aircraft so what we're seeing here is a real simplification just to let new guys in to start to understand radars so when i say this is moving up and down in bars it's moving up and down in a four bar scan now because this is a simplified radar we can't change that from four bar we just accept it is four bar we can see which bar of elevation we're scanning down there one two three and four each bar of scan is about 1.5 degrees something like that it depends exactly how the radar is set up but it is a certain amount of degrees in elevation next is our prf we can have high or we can have medium that is the actual repeat frequency of the radar and whether you want high or medium will give a better or worse radar signal depending on the current aspect you know the relative heading of the hostile and we can control that if we want by pressing the prf change so i've pressed it and we're now only scanning in high prf press it again we're now only in medium prf and if you don't know don't understand which one to use or you just don't want to worry about it we can have a third mode which is called interleave and it will now cycle between high and medium with each bar of scan and that will be your default mode if you like this is our current true airspeed of 204 knots. This is our current ground speed corrected for wind of 423 knots. This is our current range scale 
of our B scope in terms of range. So this is us here. This is a quarter, half, three quarters, a whole of that. So five miles, 10 miles, 15 miles, 20 miles. If I wanted to zoom the display out, as we saw earlier, that is now 10 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles, 40 miles. And we've got contacts on the scope now, as we can see, but we'll go through that in a bit. So our azimuth carrot here is zipping along and it hits what we call the bump stops. This is the maximum azimuth scan of our, of our antenna. So left there and right there. Now I can't remember what the full scan is, like 140 degrees or something like that for the F-15. It doesn't, it's not that important, but that is as far left and that is as far right as our antenna can scan. Next we've got our horizon line. So you've got an uptick there, a line there, a line there, and a line there. This shows our current horizon. It's probably easiest if I change, if I maneuver slightly for a second. So you can see there, we can keep our situational awareness. We know our attitude now in relation to the horizon. Next we'll look at our TDC cursor. That's this guy here represented by a couple of lines. If I'm moving him about with the TDC slew, I can move him anywhere on my B scope. Now the important thing is the relationship between this TDC cursor and these two carrots here. These two carrots here represent the minimum and maximum elevation coverage of our scan zone at the range set by our TDC cursor as set by our range scale here. So currently if that's 10 miles there what we can say that is that the maximum scannable height of our scan zone at 10 miles from us is 22. That's 22,000 feet ASL. And the minimum is 11,000 feet ASL. Now, because this is a divergent scan zone, it gets bigger the further away it is from the nose of our aircraft, then these numbers will change. So if we're at 20 miles now, set by that range scale there, the upper part of our scan zone is Angels 27, uh, 27,000 feet and the lower limit is 6,000 feet. So that means that if a hostile at a range of 20 miles that we've got now is below 6,000 feet we will not see it. If it's above 27,000 feet we will not see it. If it's between them then we will see it or at least we do have a chance of seeing it. It, was, it will be within our scan zone. Now we have to bear in mind that this radar is stabilized to the horizon. If it wasn't, every time I aimed the nose of our aircraft up, the scan zone would go up and that would be an absolute nightmare. It would mean that you'd have to fly in a straight line all the time to make use of this. But what we can do is elevate the elevation of the antenna in relation to that stabilized horizon. So if I put my scan zone up, Look at these numbers. What I'm doing is I'm aiming the elevation of my radar up. And now at 20 miles, I'm scanning between Angels 40 and Angels 19. I can also go down. So now I'm scanning between Angels 8 and Angels 0. Or I could put it into orbit, aim right the way up here. I'm now 60,000 feet to 48,000 feet. Note how the hostile contact, well the contacts disappear. That's because there are none of them at 20 miles that are between 60 and 48,000 feet. So I'm going to neutralize that again. So at 20 miles, I go on to scan between 0 feet and 21,000 feet. And that's where these hostiles are going to be. And they're starting to populate again because they just happen to be between 0 and 21,000 feet. Now that is a limit of the radar. It would be nice to be able to scan all of the elevation up to space and all of it down into the Earth. But a radar is just not that powerful. You can only scan a thin slice. So when using this radar you're constantly aiming the radar up and down your thin slice of radiation that you've got to play with to find the hostiles you will never stop doing that it's something you're always going to have to learn to do we don't need to aim it left or right because we are already at the maximum 140 degrees or so of the radar but elevation in the f-15 you will be doing it all the time so for instance if someone says oh there's someone up at angels 40 40 000 feet i'm going to put my radar range scale at the distance I expect them to be, let's say 30 miles, I'm now going to aim it up to there, so it covers 40,000 feet. Okay, let's neutralize that. That's all the symbology there. Let's just go out one more notch up to 80 miles. Next, we need to look at our contacts. So here we have radar returns. Their range from me is from there to how far up and down they are the B scope. That guy's, you know, that's if that's 20, if that's 40 miles, that guy's 30 miles. That guy is, you know, 25 miles and so on. IFF in this jet is automated because it's a simplified jet. 
a line like that is a hostile, a dot like that is a friendly, so that's just something we never have to worry about. At the moment, we cannot employ weapons. We need to get a type of track. These are not tracks per se. These are what we would call raw hits or bricks. They are just radar returns that we're seeing at the moment. If we want to find out more information and or engage weapons, we're going to lock them. So we're going to put our TDC cursor above one that we consider lock worthy. We're going to press the target lock button. Now we've got extra information. If we pause that there, we now have a, what we call an STT. So in the type of radar mode that we have at the moment, we have two radar modes, RWS and TWS, range while search, track while scan. The default mode is, although it doesn't say it, is range while search. That's what we've got here. From a range while search, we can obtain a type of trap called an STT, a single target track. That means that we are, can track one target. That means our antenna is fixed in one position. Look at that carrot there now and that carrot there. The radar is no longer moving. Oh, I've lost him. And I lost him because these radars are modeled accurately and because of the type of aspect and speed and altitude, I could no longer maintain an STT. So let's go grab another guy. Let's try and grab that guy again, shall we? No, he's going. So he's what we call faded. He's faded from our radar. We've picked him up again now. It's all about aspect and speed. Stop there again. We've got him again now. We'll talk about those phenomena in a bit if you like. So our carrot there and there is now locked fully on the target in an STT. We, while we've got an STT, we can no longer see any other targets. All of our radiation from our antenna is locked on him. And that's for good reason, because we need that to, for instance, employ a weapon on him. While we have this guy in an STT, we have extra information. We have his altitude, 12,500 feet. We have a closing speed, a combined speed of myself and him of 197 knots. We have an absolute aspect here so we can see which direction he's heading he's heading away from me and to the right that would be known as flanking right we can see what type of aircraft he is now we'll only be able to see which type of aircraft he is if he's a certain aspect to us aspect means direction compared to us and if he's within a certain range it's about 25 miles and he has to be within 30 degrees of hot aspect which means coming towards me or 30 degrees of cold aspect to allow my radar beam to see into his engine to get what we call a nctr print to find out what type of aircraft that is and the current aspect and range we can't do that so it's an, classified as unknown in that case with him in an stt we can see that he is from us a magnetic bearing of two eight three our current heading of our aircraft is about 270, so it's just off to the right of us. He's 26 nautical miles from us. We can also see that his ground speed, not his airspeed, his ground speed is about 300 here, which means his airspeed at 12 and a half thousand feet assuming isa conditions is about 250 240 knots next we've got his aspect 4r 40 degrees flanking right so if we imagine upwards like that would be cold because he's heading away from us otherwise known as zero 10 degrees right 20 degrees right 30 degrees right 40 degrees right 90 degrees right 140 degrees right 160 degrees right and then 180 degrees right, otherwise known as hot. So he's 40 degrees right. And his magnetic heading, the way that he's direct, his heading, magnetic absolute, is 327 degrees. So if we were just to unpause and watch him, we can watch these numbers. He's turning left, you can see, and we've lost him. And we've lost him because, like I said before, these radars are modelled very well. And at certain aspects, certain aircraft become invisible to radar. And it just happened that that aspect, at that range, at that speed... And also we have to factor things in like Doppler gate size. We have, this is things are called a pulse Doppler radar. It works via the Doppler effect. Essentially means that if he's moving at certain speeds and certain aspects that we won't go into now because I could talk for hours about this, he will become invisible at certain speeds and aspects and altitudes. So let's try and pick him up again. It's just something you will always be fighting with when using a BVR radar. Effects like this. Try and pick him up again. I'm pressing the button and I can't lock him. That's because he's at an aspect now where I can get a raw return from him, but I can't get a lock on him. Let's try this guy here, maybe. No, can't get him either. Possibly because he's cold aspect. How about him? Can't get him either. So we're going to have to be patient and wait until we're in the position that we can get one of these guys in an STT lock. If we're looking here, you can see that I'm there and all of almost everyone is cold at the moment. They're all heading away from me. And the nature, again, of post Doppler radar means I simply can't see these guys when they're heading cold and they're beyond a certain distance. They become invisible. Once they turn back into me, which I'll zoom forward, watch what happens when they all turn back into me. The post Doppler effect in my radar will start performing again and I'll start picking them up. 
So we should start seeing some guys now. And there they are. Now they're coming hot. I should be able to get STT tracks on them. There we go, STT. And again, all of the stuff that we talked about earlier. Note that H means he's heading hot. It's seven and a half angels and a closing speed of 700 knots. Note also, when we get a track, if I pull away from here, we've got a target designation box. That is just a box around the target. If it's got a cross through it, it's a friendly. If it's empty box, it's a hostile. Fully automated IFF. We've got his range here in 48 miles. We've got a interception of six minutes and his aspect is hot. This dynamic launch zone is relevant to weapons, so we're not going to be looking at that today. So that's pretty much all we've got to show with range while search and SCT lock. So we're going to unlock this guy. To unlock, just click on him again, click target lock to return to search like thus. Next, we're going to show track while scan. So we're going to press, in my case, the O key. And we've now got track while scan. Now, track while scan works very differently to range while search. In all modern fighter aircraft, you always have a range while search and a track while scan. And each has advantages and disadvantages. So an advantage of a track while scan is that all of these guys, all of these guys that I can see, become tracks a track means i can see lots of information about them like their direction i can see all the directions now and i can see all their altitude i couldn't see that with range roll search because range roll search only gives me the raw hits the raw bricks i just know how far away they are basically and their azimuth but with track roll scam i get their track data so we see again if they're hostile or if they're friendly but we've got all that extra information now note that we have more restrictions if you see these little circles here and here. Remember, on range while well search, they were positioned here and here. But that's because range while well search, we can see the whole azimuth. But track while well scan, one of the disadvantages of, of it is that we simply don't have enough radar power to scan fully left and right to the bump stops. The bump stops are now essentially there and there. That's as far as we can see left and right. So we can't see the entire battlefield. It's something to think about. So if I move it over there, then these guys are going to become invisible. We will lose their tracks. And over there, we'll lose these guys' tracks. Eventually, it takes a few seconds to depopulate because of how a track wall scan system works. So that's one that's one disadvantage. And in track wall scan, we don't get an STT. The result is not an STT like it is in range wall search. Instead, what we can do is we can actually lock multiple targets. I mean, technically, theoretically, these guys are all actually locked. They're all tracks at the moment. But what I can do now is if I want to lock this guy up, that's that guy locked up. If I went up to my HUD now, all that information would be up there about him. Again, all his information is here. 160 degree left, magnetic 089, 300 ground speed, 7.5 angels, closing speed 693, and so on. And because I've got a track on him, I can go fire a missile. I can go and fire an AMRAM on him if I want. But with track while scan, I can actually lock up like this multiple guys. So what I can do is I want to lock that guy, and I want to lock that guy. Uh, you can see the box around it means that he's a secondary. And I want to lock that guy, and I want to lock that guy, and I believe it's up to four I can lock. So you can see we've got primary, secondary, tertiary, and we've got the fourth guy there. And you can see the firing order is zero, one, two, three. What I could do now if I had AMRAM selected is go fire, 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 and that would fire one at him, one at him, one at him, one at him. Note it will not work with sparrows, only AMRAMs, which are designed to work with track while scan. A sparrow will not work at all with track while scan. You will need an STT via an RWS. If I wanted to unlock one of these guys, I could use the TWS unlock. I never actually tried this before. Let's try that. So I'm going to put it over him. I'm going to press the button, see what happens. Yep, I can unlock him and I can get that guy instead. And that's that. The HUD information and the locking information will always be, you know, we can only show one guy's information. So that will always be that uh, initially locked guy there. The other advantage of track while scan is that with this type of track, tracking these four guys here, the hostile will not get a radar warning on their RWR. With the STT via RWS, they will get a warning on the RWR. So that's just something to bear in mind. So immediately, if this is the first, if you're, this is your first look at radar, you'll immediately think TWS is the best. You'll always use TWS. And to be honest, that is TWS is 99% of the time the best thing to use and is what they usually advise. But you'll find that it's not always the best. In real situations with real aspects, with real fighters doing real maneuvers, not like these guys here, you'll find that sometimes you need the power of range well search and the power 
of an STT track. And remember, tracking targets isn't just about firing missiles, it's also about scaring people away, giving them psychological warning. So you may want to do an SCT to give a guy a warning you're tracking him to scare him away from a prize target or something like that. That's about it, really. Uh, note it says TWS here with track boss scam. Like I said, it's a massively oversimplified gamey type radar, but it is going to help you to get into the more simi planes within DCS, which are obviously infinitely more complex than this.